Good evening. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to our lecture series from the Institute of Spirituality. This is our fourth series of lectures that we've been presenting as part of our Carmelite ministry here at St. Cecilia's. For those of you, I think most of you know who I am, but for perhaps those of you who don't, my name is Colin Stone. I'm a Carmelite priest, and I'm the, the director of the Institute of Spirituality, and Father James is my cohort and also the pastor here at St. Cecilia's. And the community at St. Cecilia's Parish has been very welcoming of us as a Carmelite community and very supportive of our ministry here uh, in St. Cecilia's and that we, with the awareness that our ministry is not just to the parish at St. Cecilia's but to the wider church in Western Washington. As part of that ministry itself, I think t tonight's topic is very much uh, a motivating factor in it and it is St. John of the Cross, a friend in the darkness, a light for our times. And what I propose to do tonight is to, to offer an introduction to the teaching and the message of this Carmelite saint who also happens to be a doctor of the church. And I'm not sure how familiar you are with uh, St. John of the Cross, uh, but he is one of the, the guiding lights, one of the spirit behind the Carmelite family's uh, renewal with St. Teresa of Avila in the 16th century to bring about, um, how would I call it, uh, the contemplative dimension of our Christian lives. Now, unlike St. Teresa, John has had bad press. And if, when I use the word, for instance, contemplation, what kind of uh, reaction do you have to that? I mean, what kind of feelings uh, would you have when I use the word cont contemplation or contemplative prayer? Anybody want to offer a response? What does that mean to you? Contemplation, contemplative prayer. People are thinking very deeply about this right now. <laughs> Really? A quiet prayer. Okay. If I were to say that this is an elite form of prayer, which basically you will find in monasteries, it is something that nuns and monks are proficient at, and that it's not something that the ordinary layperson should bother themselves with at all. Does that sound pretty much like, okay, that's the bad press. <laughs> and what St. John has to say to us uh, is basically helping us to discover our own inner vocation, to, to realize that every human being is a contemplative. And if we miss out on that, we miss out on who we're called to be. Part of the bad press has come from, it's, it was part of the Counter-Reformation, a fearfulness about uh, what I would call pseudo-mystical experiences, that uh, the, the experience of God was something that couldn't be controlled, uh, that the idea that a person was called to intimacy with God was a form of presumption uh, and anyone who was sound in mind should not be bothered with that unless they were in some kind of hermitage or some kind of monastery where they could dedicate themselves to it. That mentality has, has lasted for up into the present century and very little has been known it's, it's kind of been kept under wraps. Today, in our times, it's like there's a rediscovery of the contemplative dimension of our being as Christians. And the need for us to recognize that as something that is part of the gospel. And this is the marvelous thing about what John's teaching is 
that it's rooted in the scriptures, that it's part of God's revelation to us, and that what he has to say to us, he's, he's, um, he's writing about his experience. He is first and foremost a poet, and as a poet, he is an artist. And it is, it is an artist and a poet that we need to touch him first. And only after we've done that will we be in a position to appreciate the fact that he, he made an attempt to, make, to write commentaries on his poetry. But if, if what happened for a lot of people was they skipped the poetry and says, let's get down to these commentaries, let's pull them apart, and with the, the true scientific method, find out what this is all about. And you can't do that with the writings of St. John. In fact, if you do that, you will happen, you, what will happen to you very likely will be what happened to me and to many good people, scholars included, who took the writings, the commentaries of St. John, especially on the ascent of Mount Carmel and the dark night of the soul, which were his two earlier writings, got bogged down in them, got discouraged by all the darkness and all what seems to be very forbidding, and lost sight of where we were going. His poetry is an attempt to express the experience that he had of union with God. And it was an attempt to express that as something that God is doing in the person. Not that the person does, but something that God does in us. And it's like if we, if we can relate to this, if we can relate to the poetry, it may speak to us. It may speak to our hearts and bypass our heads, so to speak. And he, I will read a little bit later on to you how he, in the prologue, he, he actually talks about that. That what he has in the commentary, which is much more extensive, he says, is far less than is in the poetry. And the poetry is relatively short. Okay. Without further ado, what I want to do, I want to read for you, having said the, having stressed the importance of the poetry, I want to read The Living Flame of Love, which is only four stanzas, um, not the, the, the spiritual canticle has 39 stanzas, so I won't, I'm going to read it for you in Spanish, you have the, the English right beside that, that the, the, the back it, it would be the last part of your of your handout. And as we listen to it, I would encourage you just to um, to let go of any maybe preconceived ideas you might have about who Saint John is, and see this as a person who is who's attempting to describe something very unique. And he says himself that there's as much difference between the experience of the individual person touched and transformed by the love of God as there is between, let me see, let me see if I can say that again, Be between that experience and the poetry that he has written down. There's as much difference as there is between the painting that someone, the portrait someone paints, maybe a fantastic poet, portrait, between that portrait and the living person who is being represented. There's a tremendous difference between the two. And he's saying it's the very same here, that the poetry and the experience two different things, but the poetry is as near he can come to trying to put into expression, to give expression to what God does in the soul who is surrendering to him. It is part of the transformation that God wants to perform 
if you like, in the soul. So if, if you would like to follow along, I'll read the, the Living Flame of Love in Spanish. O llama de amor viva. Do you see? Have you got it? It's at the end of, of the... Yes, yeah, on seven, seven, page 717, down at the bottom of that. It's called The Living Flame of Love, is the heading of it. I would, I would just like you to be able, if you follow it, if you don't understand Spanish, to follow it in your the English translation, so that you'll have the sound of it, and at the same time some sense of the meaning of what this person is saying, and what kind of a setup this is. O llama de amor viva que tiernamente hieres de mi alma en el más profundo centro. Pues ya no eres esquiva, acaba ya si quieres, rompe la tela de este dulce encuentro. Oh cauterio suave, oh regalada llaga, oh mano blanda, O oh, toque delicado, que a vida eterne, eterna sabe, y toda deuda paga, matando muerte en vida la has trocado. Oh lámparas de fuego, en cuyos resplandores las profundas cavernas del sentido que estaba oscuro y ciego con extraños primores, calor y luz dan junto a su querido. Cuán manso y amoroso recuerdas en mi seno, donde secretamente solo moras, y en tu es aspirar sabroso de bien y gloria lleno, cuán delicadamente me enamoras. So this is about love. This is what he is saying. And it's about an encounter, an exchange of love between God and the human person. And he uses especially in his canticle, spiritual canticle, the image of the Song of Songs, of God being the spouse of the beloved, and the human person being the spouse. So that God uses the imagery, spousal imagery, to try to describe what we are being called to, what God is inviting us to. And what he is saying here is that every human person is called to this intimacy. In the prologue to the, to the living flame that I just read for you, no, sorry, it isn't the prologue, it's, the, it's a commentary on this, uh, this, this first, uh, the first verse, the first stanza. He has this to say, and he's commenting on the words, O living flame of love that tenderly wounds my soul in its deepest center. This is what John says, and I would, I would draw your attention to the, to the biblical roots of what he's talking. This is not just a crazy idea or a marvelous idea that he thought up. This is part of God's revelation to us in the scriptures. This is part of the church's teaching. He says, the living flame of love, that image, that reality, is the Holy Spirit, which wounds the soul in its deepest center. And he says this about it, I do not doubt that some persons, not understanding them, that these experiences that the, pers that the, the person has, through their own knowledge, or knowing of them through experience. In other words, someone who hasn't experienced God like this 
will either fail to believe them or consider the account of them an exaggeration. And he says, yet I reply to all these persons that the Father of lights, that's a reference to St. James, who is not close-fisted but diffuses himself abundantly as the sun does its rays without being a respecter of persons, a reference to the Acts of the Apostles, where God does not respect persons. Wherever there is room, always showing himself gladly along the highways and byways, does not hesitate or consider it of little import to find his delights with the children of men at a common table in the world. That's a reference to Proverbs, chapter 8, verse 31. It is by delight to be with the children of men. And so he is appealing to what God is revealing to us in the scriptures to back up what he is saying that the Holy Spirit is the living flame of love. And it is the Holy Spirit that touches and wounds the person with a wound of love that makes the person long all the more for union with God. And he says, and it should not be held as incredible in a soul now examined, purged, and tried in the fire of tribulations, trials, and many kinds of temptations, and found faithful in love that the promise of the Son of God be fulfilled. The promise that the most blessed Trinity will come and dwell within anyone who loves him. And that's a reference to St. John's Gospel, chapter 14, where John says, where Jesus says, anyone who loves me, my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our dwelling place within him. This is a reference to that. The Blessed Trinity inhabits the soul by divinely illumining its intellect with the wisdom of the Son, delighting its will in the Holy Spirit, and by absorbing it powerfully and mightily in the delightful embrace of the Father's sweetness. And so, what he is saying here is that people who haven't experienced it are going to say that this is exaggerated or they're going to say, I don't believe it. And my sense is that today there is a hunger in people everywhere for God or prayer. That people are experiencing that hunger in a new way. And that John of the Cross is someone who can be a friend to us in our darkness because the hunger frequently is experienced in the midst of pain in the midst of trial, in the midst of doubt, in the midst of darkness, in the midst of sometimes despair, that this is something, it's an experience which is too common to be just dismissed as you know, something that's happening in our times, that people are experiencing a longing for God within them, and that John offers us a light to be able to see, to be able to hang in there, if you like, this is what he is saying in his teaching, is don't quit, don't give up, hang in there, trust that God's promise to you may be fulfilled, trust that the person of Jesus is who he says he is for you, and that he is calling you to intimacy with himself. Now, the question, uh, I, want to, I want to do two things. I want to first of all ask the question, who is John writing for? Because he does definitely say he is not writing for what he calls beginners. And some people say, oh well, okay, let me go and get some. He says there's plenty of stuff being written for beginners. And it's my sense that beginners, in his sense of the word, are people who are in the first process of being converted to God. 
who are in the first process of turning away from a life of sin to trying to live you know, in, as followers of Christ. Now, I think it's important to add that he is writing for sinners. He is not writing for people who are sinless. He's writing for sinners. He's writing for you and for me. I don't think any of us would be here tonight if we weren't making some effort to seek God in our lives. If we weren't making some effort to do God's will in our life, to find out what is it that God wants from me? What is it that I need to do? In other words, we are experiencing and being drawn by God. However, you know, it's not some big, you know, mystical experience. It's a very human a longing or a yearning, a desiring. And that's what John of the Cross is writing about all the time. This human yearning, human desire. And what I, I read this poem for you, and he himself, he, he says, it's a description of a person who is being transformed by God, a person who has been tried, who has been, uh, who has gone through the mill, so to speak, and who has hung in there, who has in, in the face of feeling abandoned by God, of feeling that there is no God, and yet has hung in. In spite of not having any, uh, if you like, satisf satisfaction out of what's going on. Um, he says that this experience of being touched by God in, in a way that uses the imagery of lovers, the imagery that is in the Song of Songs, the imagery that is here of how tenderly you wound me in the deepest center of my being and wanting that union to be complete. And this is what, in his final work, which was The Living Flame of Love, he wrote that uh, for a lady in Spain called Ana de Penelosa. It was his last work that he wrote, and he said, the way I'm going to do this for you, I'm going to try to take the poem verse by verse, and then line by line, and I'm going to try to explain it to you as best I can. And he says to her, now I know that you haven't studied scholastic theology, and it's through scholastic theology that we understand the what's going on here. He was speaking 400 years ago. Um, but he says, you do have what he calls mystical theology, by which God communicates knowledge to us through love. And this you do have. And so your understanding of what I am trying to say in the poetry may be just as good, if not better, than my understanding. And so he is he's almost appealing to this experience as something which is there and it's not his property. I mean, it's not just his own uh, private experience that he is deigning to share with other people. He sees this as a manifestation of what God is doing in human beings and what God is calling human beings to. And for a man who was who was recognized as being a fairly gentle person. There's a whole section of the living flame of love where he cuts loose and lambastes spiritual directors who try to keep people in the state of the givers and say, forget about that contemplative stuff, forget about all this mystical stuff, you do your meditation and stay there. And he says, he really hits hard at them and says they do an awful lot of harm because they cause terrific pain to people who need 
to be encouraged to move on. We'll need to be encouraged that God is guiding them, that God is with them, that God is encouraging them and inviting them on. And he even gives signs by which people can recognize when it is time to move on. That when you go from a situation where in your prayer, maybe as a person who say being converted to Christ for the first time, you might hear about Jesus in the Gospels. You might read about Jesus in the Gospels. And maybe reading the parables or the stories of the life of Jesus, you think about them. And you are drawn very strongly to them. You feel devotion by being drawn to them. And that's how God draws us in the beginning. But after a while, God starts to wean us away from that. And that source of satisfaction begins to dry up. And people wonder, what did I do wrong? No, I must have goofed somewhere. I must have sinned somewhere that I'm being punished because now I get no satisfaction out of what before used to be really nice. You know, and I, I went for it. And now there seems to be nothing. And to have a priest, usually it was a priest who told them, go and say your rosary or go and meditate on the Gospels. And don't be uh, having... You know, making a big issue out of it. And they would go back dutifully and experience a lot of pain and a lot of frustration because God was drawing them to a place where they could no longer relate to God in the same way. They could no longer think about the mysteries of the life of Jesus, for instance, or ideas or devotions that used to fill them with devotion and uh, good feelings that take that what they need to do is to let go and to be quiet and to trust that God is there because what is happening is that God is communicating himself to them no longer through, say, the images of Jesus in the Gospel or through the devotions that they used to have. And I don't mean by that that once you have got to this stage, you never again ever relate to Jesus in the Gospel. You are always relating to Jesus in the Gospel. But here it is coming to a point where God is the one who is working in so God is the one who is communicating to them through love and through faith and through hope. And faith to our minds, to our human minds, which are used to having something to get your teeth into, faith to the human mind is total darkness. Hope to the human memory is darkness. And love to the human will. It doesn't experience what it used to be able to hold on to. And yet this is how God communicates himself to us. And as John speaks in his poetry, he's saying this is an attempt to describe the heights, and if I if I were to use an image, the image that he uses himself is Mount Carmel, and it's the ascent of Mount Carmel. And what he's describing in the living flame and the spiritual canticle is what God is calling the person to here. It's like heaven on earth. It's the next step to heaven and yet it is experienced by people while they're still here and what he's saying is that this is what God is calling us to but only God I mean it's not something that we can achieve of ourselves it is something that God does within us that God calls us to and the reason why it's so important to to listen 
to this. It's a bit like the apostles at the transfiguration. Jesus brought them up to the mountain, do you remember? And he was transfigured before them. He comes down again and everything is going on as usual. But they must have remembered that. St. Peter certainly did afterwards when he refers back to what happened on the mountain when Jesus' divinity shone through his humanity. And this is a little bit like this. For those of us who are here, you know, struggling up the hill here, trying to get, move up here. And it's like, you know, when you're going up a mountain, you have, and you're looking at the top here, you get to the top and say, oh no, you got another one to go. And you get, you get up to here, and there's another one. And you go, is this ever going to end? You know, and, and that's, you know, that can really be a very real temptation for a person to say, hey, and, and, and John describes the pain that a person goes through in the dark night. The point about reading these first and the importance of being exposed to the poetry and the experience before you start into the commentary is that you, it's, it's a reminder that this is where we're going. If we never are introduced to this and we just start off down here, I don't think we're going to get very far before we get stuck, we get bogged down. And there, there isn't any, there's nothing to draw us. And the remembrance of what we're being called to is what draws us, is what, is what gives us the impetus to keep going and to be able to come back to what God is saying to us, that it is my delight to be with the children of men, to realize that it is the love of God being poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, who is this living flame of love. And the imagery that John uses is very powerful imagery, and I think it's, it's central to his teaching, and it's important to us in our understanding of what our spiritual journey is about. I'm going to ask, take a little break here and ask you to think in terms of the image of fire. Because this is, like he says, that the, the Holy Spirit is the living flame within the person. It's the Holy Spirit, it's the Spirit of God within us that is this, this fire. It's the image of fire. And when you think of that in terms of, like say, human evolution, the impact of the discovery of fire on our development, the impact of, of what fire what influence fire has on our lives today? Think about that for a second. And I want to ask you maybe to come up with some, what are qualities of fire that benefit us today? Think about it for a second. anyone like to volunteer what what are qualities of fire warmth, warmth. okay I'm, is they're fairly obvious I mean, this is not a trick question by the way um, but I, I want to to get the qualities of fire and then do something with them okay anybody else light okay energy Security. Okay. How would it be security? Well, you know, staying the fire would keep, keep animals away. Okay, all right. That's getting down to real basic stuff, isn't it? <laughs> if you're out in the wilds. Yeah, okay. Consuming. Consuming. Okay, would, would you put that as say under energy, like it consuming? Oh. I'll put it, I'm, I'm not sure if I understand what what you mean, in what sense you mean that, but I'll put it down anyway, and maybe it'll, uh, Alan. Well, maybe a better uh, finding of the concept of transforming, transforms as a metal, or as It transforms, metal. okay. Would that be what yeah. you're, okay. Transforming. Um, 
terms as in, say, metal or wood. And I'll come back to that because he uses that image. In Okay, it purifies, e.g. water. Anything else? What about food? Eating, cooking. Right, yeah. I mean, we're able to digest a lot of stuff because of fire. If we weren't able to cook it, we wouldn't be able to digest it. So it's like the, it's a, Let's just take, does anybody have a brilliant one that they want to put on before last? Okay. Yeah. Solidify. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, would that be part of, like, say, transforming? Yes. Okay. Okay. Like, say, with metal. Okay. Um, it, it, it burns. Yes. Well, I think, okay, I'll put, I, I'll put it on here. It does it burn. I don't think so. Sin is a spiritual thing. Fire is a physical thing. So that there's no equation between the two. So think about that one. <laughs> okay. But um, it's, it's not that unrelated. If, if you think what, what hell really is, is the absence of this fire. That's what hell is. Is the total absence of, the, of love. Okay. And that's not something that God ever, ever wants for any human being. That's, that's the declared universal will of, sal of salvation. That it's no part of God's will that any human being would be deprived of this love. Now, warmth, as distinct from the coldness that we can experience in our lives. And I, what I want to do is to try to, to use this imagery as a metaphor for our own journey through life. Whether you want to call it a journey of faith, you know, what label you put on it isn't that important. Whether you want to call it climbing the, the mountain, uh, the journey through life that these if, you, you, if we use the, the metaphor of fire the image of fire to, to apply to what's going on uh, to be able to see especially how the warmth counteracts the cold that we can sometimes experience how the light can counteract the darkness. So we're into opposites. Energy to keep going when we feel that we can't go another step. This is what the light provides. Um, security when we are insecure. Or, and I'll come back to this later on, when we're looking for security where we can't possibly find it. And that's very applicable today when we look for security, we look for the satisfaction or the fulfillment of our desires where they can never be fulfilled. As St. Augustine used to say, uh, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. And John is coming up with the same message. But what is often, you see, when people just read the Dark Knight, say, or the Ascend Mount Carmel, he, he gets caricatured as instead of being called the mystical doctor, he's called the doctor of the nadas, the nothings, because he talks about nothing will satisfy us short of God. And so people tend to get the negation aspect of it, and they say, this is too much. And they get discouraged. And I'm speaking for myself, because this is where I started off in the seminary, trying to, to uh, you know, plow my way through this. And I'm not the only one. Many people have got bogged down and say, forget it. 
uh, get bogged down in in the the ascent and think and see all they see is negations not realizing that the man that's talking has been and experienced the mountaintop and in these works he includes what has gone before in the other ones in other words he recapitulates what he has talked about in his earlier works and so if we if someone asks well and this is something I wanted to make how do we go about studying or reading St. John of the Cross you need to read him backwards I mean that sounds crazy but to be able to really understand them it's letting you see where you're going so that you can make the journey and I, this, the same professor he's um, Keith Egan he's a, a Carmelite scholar uh, he's uh, a man who has done a lot of, of work in Carmelite spirituality he, as a professor, he used to teach Dante's Paradiso. Uh, you know, that was a regular course that he used to give. And he began to realize that as he would do the purgatorio, uh, you know, year after semester after semester, that there was no way that the students could possibly understand the purgatorio unless they had first read the Paradiso. And so you had to read about paradise before you could understand purgatory. And, it's, and he applies, the analogy applies to St. John too, that to be able to understand his earlier works properly and not get bogged down in them, they are not well put together. Whereas his last work, The Living Flame, is his best put together work. It's also interesting too that The Living Flame and the Canticle, he wrote them for women. I don't know whether that says anything or not, the other two works were scholastic attempts at scholastic treatises that he wrote for the, the, the friars, for the men, and he never finished them. He got bogged down himself. He was never able to get them finished. And so this, to come back to the, the point I'm making here, I hope I'm not over uh, doing it, but that on this journey, the awareness that it is the experience of love that draws us and that the negations that are involved it's not when he speaks of negation he's thinking always union and what he's saying in effect is don't settle for less and that's what we do we have a tendency to settle for less and I was I think it's Anthony de Mello that says to presume that people want to be free is wrong. To, to presume that people want to change is wrong. And it's interesting that even Jesus, when, they were, when he came into the place where the, the waters were moved and the, all the people who were sick were sitting around in this place and whoever got into the water first was, was cured. And there was this fellow here, 38 years. 38 years, that's a long time. And so Jesus goes over to him, and what does he say? Anyone remember what he says? That was his answer. But Jesus says, do you want to be cured? And we said, of course he wants to be cured. I'm not so sure. After 38 years, you get used to whatever it is, and you're not that keen to move out into new territory. There was an episode, I've shared this with many of you before, I think, the episode of Star Trek, where the, are there any Trekkies here? One or two. They were sent to this constellation, this place where there was a planet, and, uh, you know, light years away from us, of course, and in this planet, there was a, a, there was a small minority of a super race that was running the whole planet and they, their energy and, so, and riches were supplied by an under race which lived underground. And the mission of the Enterprise crew, not allowed to interfere with the history, they're not allowed to intervene directly, but all they were going to do was, they had got word that there was a revolution being planned and all they had to do was to be there at the moment and unlock the doors to let the people out so they could affect their own liberation. 
So the, uh, the whole hour goes by, and the moment arrives, and they get, and they have these huge, massive iron bars on these gates, and you can see all the people walking up and down inside, and the crew are looking in, and it's the time. So they come to unlock the gates. Lo and behold, they find out they're not locked. And to see the message there for us here on planet Earth is that people get used to their enslavement. They get used to their own freedom, and they don't want to move out of it. And God is calling us to freedom. And it means letting go maybe of comfortable places, letting go of, of areas of our life that we don't want to, to mess with, or seeing areas that in which we, uh, we feel you know, we've got our comfortable niche. And I'm, I'm, I'm not... Uh, I'm one of those who struggles with that too. But what I'm saying is, this man, John of the Cross, who, who is centenary we're celebrating this year, that's why I'm beginning off with this uh, presentation, that he, if you like, he's a man sent by God to teach us who we are, to teach us what we can be, to enlighten us. And the church in its wisdom has recognized that he, he has been declared in this century, in the 1920s, a doctor of the church. In other words, he is a teacher, and he's a teacher of spiritual theology, of our relationship to God. Decirle 
again that was an attempt to express the experience of God and it, with the use of the imagery of being wounded and going up looking for him and you're gone where are you I mean that's something that that's a cry that comes from every human heart and to be able to recognize in what he is saying something that's speaking to our own hearts that this is not something reserved for some special elite that this is something that God is calling each one of us to and he, like in that last uh, stanza where he asks the woods and the thickets the beauty of creation bears the stamp of the creator and it speaks to the person of the beloved and that's something that has a great appeal for us in the northwest when we see the beauty of creation speaks to people's hearts now, driving up just last week there was a gap between the snows and the rains and the sun came out and to see the cascades with the sun the slanting sh sun shining on those mountains I mean, it was lucky that we didn't have a crash, but with all that traffic, I mean, you could see the people looking. And that was speaking to something in the human heart. It's, the, it's creation calling to us. It is God speaking to us through our, through our own reflection of God, through our own being images of God. A person who was nourished, if you like, on St. John of the Cross, was St. Therese of Lisieux. And it's an interesting thing that at that time, St. John of the Cross, the works of St. John, were not read in the French Carmels. But it was around 1891, that was before that actually, but there was an, in there was an interest in the centenary of John, his death, coming up again and so a new edition of his works were published and it, it, the, the likelihood is that when St. Teresa, St. Therese says that she was so nourished by what St. John had to say to her that she, she was talking about the spiritual canticle and the living flame and the chances are that she did not have the Ascent of Mount Carmel or the Dark Knight available to her but that the point that's being made is that the whole of his doctrine is in the living flame and in the spiritual canticle. So if we read those first and, and let them speak to us first, then we can go back and not be discouraged, be aware that, that the negation that, we, that comes through so strongly in, in the earlier works is always, always speaking of union. He's always talking it in the context of union with God. And union with God, for me and for you, is not some esoteric experience. Basically, it's washing up the dishes, lighting the fire, closing the door, doing things that you would never even think twice about. Ordinary, simple, everyday things that constitute the will of God for you and for me. That's what union with God is involved in, in a practical on a practical level it's not some you know being caught up in some rapture you know it isn't something wild that will scare the daylights out of you and for saint therese herself she never had any extraordinary experiences this is what she says what insights i have gained from the works of our holy father saint john of the cross when i was 17 and 18 mark you and again she did not consider herself anything very special she was still doing her best like anybody else this was in the years 1890 and 1891 she says when i was 17 and 18 i had no other spiritual nourishment i begged god to accomplish in me what he wrote in other words she she read this she read this poetry she read his teaching and she asked God to accomplish that in her. 
Because only God can accomplish it in us. It's not something that we make happen. Okay. The doctor of love satisfied the deepest aspirations of this young novice's eager heart. And she's writing to her sister Marie. And she says, my dearest Marie, for my part, I know of no other means to arrive at perfection except love. To love how well our hearts are made for that. Sometimes I try to find another word to express love, but on this earth of exile, words are powerless to communicate all the vibrations of the soul. And so I have to be satisfied with this one word, love. This was the only way she could express it. Express it. The fear of God, which she found, which she found in certain sisters, paralyzed her. My nature is such that fear makes me recoil. With love, not only do I go forward, I fly. And I don't think there's any of us who couldn't say that that's true for us too. And that each of us, in our own way, we wrestle with the fear of God. That I know for myself, it was, it was beaten into me as a, as a child. I mean, it was done with all the best will in the world, but I'm still trying to work my way out of it. In today's first reading at, at today's Mass, it was interesting that it was taken from St. John's first epistle, and where he says that perfect love casts out fear. And as long as we're still, I guess all of us are still, in one way or another, we're still imperfect, but that when, when God transforms us, to use that, that quality of fire, that this is what God does within us, when that transformation takes place, fear is taken away. And we are freed up to be ourselves. And that's, that is the destiny, that's the calling of every one of us. And it is God's design. It's not because I am somebody special, because I am, because I've done such certain things or with my life or that I have. It's because God wants to have this intimacy. God wishes for me to love him. St. John has that marvelous thing in the, the uh, it's in the living flame when he's commenting on uh, let's see this is not in your handout but it is uh, it's a part of the commentary on Chapman stanza 3 he says in the first place it should be known that if a person is seeking God his beloved or her beloved is seeking him or her much more and that's something I think to reflect on that no matter how how strenuously how ardently we may be seeking God God is seeking us much more and just to allow that truth to be and to let go of the the attitude which says, I have to do it. I have to make it happen. And that, that, that's not the case. In other words, that God won't be open to me, that what God won't be giving me his grace unless I produce the goods, unless I'm able to measure up to a certain standard. And that's not, that's not what God is revealing to us at all. And got to go back to Genesis again, uh, which I often do. God is creating us in his own image. God sees what he has created and says, this is very good. God delights to be with us. So John says here, in the first place it should be known that if a person is seeking God, his beloved is seeking him much more. John also says in another place uh, where he himself was suffering a lot of persecution and discrimination and the sisters were concerned about him uh, and he says don't be worried about it God will take care of everything and in terms of how I respond to these people who have beaten up on me if you like uh, he says where there is no love put love and there you will find love 
tremendously powerful teaching for us to reflect on. And it, you know, a very hard one for us to put into practice too. I want to refer to one of the images that we used here as a quality of fire and how that, uh, he, he speaks about this. Even though it is true that what these and the other stanzas describe is all one state of transformation and that as such one cannot pass beyond it. Yet with time and practice, love can receive added quality. He's saying that there's, it's almost like a, an open-ended uh, growth that even though a person has achieved transformation in love, there can still be more given to it. Love can receive added quality, as I say, and become more intensified. We have an example of this in the activity of fire. Although the fire has penetrated the wood, transformed it, and united it with itself, Yet, as this fire grows hotter and continues to burn, the wood becomes much more incandescent and inflamed, even to the point of flaring up and shooting out flames from itself. It should be understood that the soul, now speaking, has reached this enkindled degree. That the fire the living flame of love, which is the Holy Spirit within us, transforms us into himself. So that we too become, in a sense, like God. That God will participate in God's nature. And this is what God is inviting us to. And the sad thing is that we do settle for less. be to say something about the life of St. John. Uh, maybe some, I can't give you the whole of his life, I don't know about the whole of his life, but some relevant facts like today, as I say, is this year is the fourth centenary of his death. And so there are all over the world there are special celebrations, symposia, presentations, conferences on St. John of the Cross. He's recognized his teaching and his writings are recognized not just in the Catholic Church as key teachings for the spiritual life, for the stages of spiritual growth, for having some insight into the dynamics of what happens in us as we grow as persons, as, as God's transforming love works within us. He's also recognized beyond uh, the Church. Like in the Eastern religions, they will, seek, they will honor him as a great mystic. Uh, to get past the idea of a mystic as being someone with their head in the clouds, I mean, maybe I'm encouraging that by using the image of the mountain, and uh, I was sharing with someone there that the mountain is not a comfortable image for a lot of people. It's not a comfortable image for me. I prefer to use the image of the journey inwards, and St. Teresa's image of the interior castle, or the, the, the person being like a crystal diamond with God living in the center, and that our journey is a journey inward to God present within us. Um, John is recognized in Eastern traditions, in as well as in the Christian, especially in the Catholic uh, tradition. But he is very definitely a Catholic, a Christian scholar who is rooted in in the Bible, in the scriptures, his teaching is rooted in God's revelation to us there. So it, it, it's, um, if you are reading or studying St. John, um, as I said before, to begin at the, at, the, at the end and work backwards is a safer, and keep coming back 
to the uh, to the poetry, which is as close to the experience as we can get. The, the commentary is a step further than that, and he says there's less in the commentary than there is in the poetry, and that your interpretation of the poetry may be as good, if not better, than his own, and that the poetry itself is as different from the experience as the portrait is from the person, the living, the live person who is being portrayed. And yet, all of us are called to that experience. St. John, in his own uh, experience, was he was a person who had very uh, strong compassion for the poor because he himself was brought up in poverty. His, um, his mother basically raised him. His father died shortly after he was born and his mother lived in poverty. Um, he was, if, if you like, the son of a weaver. She was a weaver of silk and he was the son of a weaver and he was educated in an orphanage type of place uh, and he had an opportunity to learn tailoring, sculpturing, uh, other trades of the craftsmen in the area. He eventually worked his way through college by working in a hospital for syphilis patients. So he was really in touch with what was going on in the world and he had a great compassion for people who suffered for the sick. Um, when St. Teresa met him, which was a kind of a crucial uh, moment in his life, he was recently ordained and he was thinking of leaving the Carmelites and becoming a Carthusian, which is an order dedicated to contemplation, uh, to, to prayer. Teresa persuaded him to wait and to become a collaborator with her in the renewal of the Carmelite family, out of which the, the uh, the Reformed Carmel, the Discalced Carmelites, that's myself and James's um, group, uh, emerged out of that. And he did um, that. In his writings, as with St. Teresa, they're always writing with the Inquisition looking over their shoulder. And that's a very nervous uh, way to be, because the Inquisition, it didn't, it wasn't uh, church and state separation. It was church and state together. If you didn't do what you were told, you got your head chopped off or you got tortured or whatever it was. The Spanish Inquisition does not have uh, a good press, so to speak, uh, even though the intent behind it was to preserve the faith. Um, to try to, to condense his own experience and with misunderstandings about what he was involved in, what he wasn't involved in, uh, he was accused of being a renegade within the order, that he didn't have authority to be doing what he was doing. And I'm not going to try to, to explain all the ins and outs of it, but he ended up uh, being put into prison, being captured and physically put into a prison, which was basically a closet at the top of a, of a house in Toledo. And it was there that it was, a, it was, there was no window. It was a small closet about 10 feet by but from here to the wall and there. That, that was about the size of it. There was a door with a little slit about that size in it up high. And he was a small man. He was even smaller than I am. But um, uh, he was freezing in the winter and roasting in the summer. And he spent, I think was it, set, was it seven months? Seven or eight months in that jail. And it was with, when he was there, he wrote the spiritual canticle. And he was, you know, he was stripped of everything. He, had, he was living on bread and water and sardines. And he was publicly humiliated regularly. Uh, that was part of his penance, part of his punishment. And it was out of that experience that he was, uh, I guess partly trying to keep himself occupied and started to write the poetry. And it was in, out of that dark night that the experience, this love poetry came. And it was afterwards that he completed it and uh, some of the sisters that he was working on, he escaped from the place. Uh, they asked him if he would explain what his poetry was about, and he started to write the commentaries on the poetry. Um, this is something that I've already made reference to you before, but um, it's, it's a poem that I've used 
it's like my little national anthem. I've used it a lot, the Magi poem. Um, and in a sense, for me, it connects with St. John of the Cross very really because it is, it's part of what he's saying, don't settle for less and try to come to an awareness of what you are being called to and how we can be sidetracked so very easily, especially in our, not just our consumer society, any age, human nature can get sidetracked and we can, by our desires, our yearning for satisfaction, for completion, and we can start looking for it in places where it's not going to be found. And we can start to, not just to accept the gifts of God, but to cling to the gifts of God as though they were God himself. And God wants us to accept his gifts, to enjoy his gifts, but also to let go, to let go of them. To let go and let God, because God is the only one who will satisfy us. Here's this poem, the major poem, I call it. It's taken from an Iranian Christmas card. God bless us, we should be praying for peace. That uh, Archbishop Hunthausen sent this to the priests of the Archdiocese back in 1987. Obviously it touched him, and it has touched me since then, and I share it as often as I can with people. If, as with Herod, we fill our lives with things, and again with things, if we consider ourselves so important that we must fill every moment of our lives with action, when will we have the time to make the long, slow journey across the burning desert as did the Magi? Or sit and watch the stars as did the shepherds? Or brood over the coming of the child as did Mary. For each of us, there is a desert to travel, a star to discover, and a being within ourselves to bring to life. And that's what St. John is telling us, that he has experienced God's love, that each of us is called to experience that love, and that as we, as we recognize that we have a journey to travel, a star to discover, and a being within us to bring to life, to know that what allows that to happen is love. It is the experience of love. And to go back to the poetry, if you're reading his works, Keep the poetry open on one side and keep your Bible open on the other side. And keep going back. He says, if you get stuck in the commentary, go back to the poem. And it's like, it's reminding us that we are called by love. And that our, what gives meaning and direction and fulfillment and transformation to our lives is this fire that Christ wishes to inflame within us. It is the fire of the Holy Spirit within us, the living flame of love.